Next, when let's talk about this one. This is news courtesy from RA regarding a U-turn in Georgia law that was um, really controversial, that a lot of protests have happened around it. And, you know, suddenly the law changed, which is flipping great because usually these protests, you feel like they're mute and they just serve one purpose to kind of get people interested, to kind of just speak out. But in terms of actually changing stuff, nothing happens, but it's nice to see a change was affected here in Georgia. It says here, Left Bank founder um, Gasha Bakradi Bakradis Radze has said Bak Radze said the decision is a clear indication that people's voices and actions can be made the difference. It says Georgia's parliament has voted to drop a controversial bill following the mass protest. Lawmakers voted 50, 35 to 1 against the bill last Friday, March 10th, at a session that lasted just over four minutes and featured no discussion. The vote came after thousands of people took to the streets of Capitol Tbilisi last week to protest against the so-called foreign agents law, which critics said would have restricted press freedom and civil liberties. And if you're wondering what this um, foreign agents law was, I just quickly looked it up and found this article courtesy of Reuters that explains it in harrowing detail. What is the proposed foreign agency law? Individuals, civil society organizations and media outlets that receive 20% of their aid or funding sorry, from abroad would be required to register as a foreign agent influence with the Georgian Justice of Ministry. Now, let's be known. If that's the case, that title isn't good, right? If you think about it, let's just let's just put that out there. You don't want to be ascribed as a kind of an, an agent of foreign influence or whatever nonsense that is. It continues. Organizations would have to meet what Human Rights Watch described as an um, onerous reporting requirements and inspections and would face fines of up to 25,000 um, Georgian Lari, $9,600 for failing to comply with prison sentences up to five years for repeated offenses. Swaths of Georgian civil society including electoral election monitors, corruption watchdogs, and independent media outlets would have been covered by the law. Rights groups say that the foreign agents tag is designed to make it easier for the government to discredit its opponents. So clearly that was going to be a bad bill. So them protesting and getting it turned around was amazing. The protests were strongly backed by the city's clubbing community with venues such as Bassi Bassiani, which I definitely need to go to. Um, another venue here called KHIDI, another venue here called Left Bank, released statements in condemning the proposed bill. Speaking to resident advisor, Left Bank founder uh, Gashka Bazrazi says as follows. A testament to the power of collective action and a clear indication that people's voices can make a difference. I am particularly heartened by the fact that this victory isn't attributed to the opposition, but to the new generation of activists who came forward to defend the democratic rights. This shows that when people from diverse socioeconomic groups, political beliefs and backgrounds come together for a common cause, meaningful change can be achieved. So it's great to see that that's happened. I love to see the flags there. You've got the EU flag, the Georgian flag, the Ukrainian flag, everyone coming and joining together. Um, it's great. Lovely. Happy to see this. And I can't wait. Wait. I can't wait. I can't wait to see more. I can't wait to see more. Okay, Richard is saying, got a friend over there. Rated. Yeah. I need to go to Georgia, man. I need to go to Georgia. I've been having it on my bucket list for a while, but I keep kind of putting it off because I keep, you know, making the easy choice of going to places like Berlin all the time. But I need to kind of venture out there, which I'll probably end up doing sometime this year. I need to see what all the hype is about, but definitely interested to go. Um, next on the list here, we've got uh, another story here, courtesy of RA. It says they've got a new RA film is going to document Ukraine's electronic music scene during a war, which is really crazy to kind of see. I remember seeing a really interesting clip, courtesy, I think, of the YouTube channel DW. Obviously, it's a media outlet, obviously, out there in Germany also. Um, but they put together a really cool little clip that I thought was very illuminating during the whole war. They basically said there are parts of Ukraine even parts of Kiev that haven't been where people are basically trying to get back to normal and people are kind of partying and whatnot and throwing these little day raves and parties and whatnot and the interview the people who were there and a lot of the guys there, guys and girls were feeling kind of guilty. They were feeling kind of guilty that they basically had the opportunity to party when other parts of the country were, you know, were basically getting bombed day and night. And um, it kind of made them feel a little bit, you know, just having that kind of weird survivor's remorse that they're still there and they're choosing to do that sort of thing. But then on the other side of things, a lot of them were saying that they needed a release because they're basically living in a war zone and they need an opportunity to just release and forget about the ills of their day-to-day -day lives and kind of have some level of fun. So it's a kind of a weird place to kind of be at at the same time. Um, but it's also cool 
to see a lot of the local community in nightlife has really mobilized and kind of gathered together. Many people within the scene have gone to actually fight on the front lines, which is absolutely insane. But it's actually happening there. A lot of people kind of, you know, stepped up when their country needed them the most. So that's been cool to see. But it's also interesting to think about in terms of what's happening in Ukraine, just how much the political discourse around it has changed. And when this movie does debut, it's not going to be met with probably the same resounding uh, amount of love as it would have done at the beginning of the war, especially considering the amount of money different countries have kind of sent over there and stuff. Like it's become really complicated issue to kind of pass and get your head around and what way you should stand and whatnot. But anyway, I'm interested to see the film when it does come out regardless. I want to just check it out and see what the vibe is like on that side. And usually RA, even though it's not what it used to be as a site, what they really do well is these kind of um, visual essays and documentaries kind of really highlighting and kind of, you know, um, digging deep into various scenes and whatnot. Because this is how I basically discovered stuff when I was coming up and I was in the ends and didn't really know nothing. So the article says as follows. A new resident advisor documentary exploring how Ukraine's once thriving electronic scene has been affected by the Russian invasion will premiere in Berlin and London next month. Co-produced by RA and Tabor, Ukraine Nightlife and Resistance examines a topic through the lens of six unique stories, each one identifying how the scene changed overnight. Among the the personalities featured are drag performer and bouncer Vlad Shest, electronic composer Hinlani, DJ promoter and bar owner Garrick, Pledov and a team behind the venues Closer, Modal and TU. I actually, honestly, this is a story I always kind of say, but my next place I was meant to go to um, when the, before the pandemic happened was Ukraine and was to go to Kiev. Like I had everything listed. I had the Airbnb I was going to go to and the only thing I didn't book was the flights. And then as soon as I was just about to go book them, that's when the war in flipping Ukraine started or the invasion from Russia obviously started and then, you know, all the plans got scuppered. But obviously, the you know, I was able to kind of just, you know, leave the flipping um, Airbnb um, there because I think in the early parts, of the war a lot of people had booked trips to go to ukraine too and what they did to kind of like you know uh, give money back to the people was basically just you know not cancel the booking and let the flipping um host of the apartments take the money and stuff and use that for whatever they needed to use it for so that was pretty nice little gesture people were doing in the middle of the pandemic it continues it looks like these stories this film also explores why kiev became such a prominent city in the context of club culture and looks the future or to assess the long-term implications of the war made possible through Ari's partnership with Jägermeister. Jägermeister sponsoring a documentary about you. Mm, interesting. Um, the premiere will take place at Berlin's Passage Kino um, April 5th and London's Barbican Centre April 11th. I'll be there. They'll feature Q&A sessions with the film's protagonists, moderated by RA's um, editors, RA editors um, Chloe Lula and Carlos Hawthorn, Hawthorn, respectively. The film will also be screened at Kiev at a later date. Um, ahead of the film's release, RA's hosting a Ukraine fundraiser at London Club Fabric this Thursday. Um, while like Thursday, part of the money raised from the premiers will be split into two charities: Insight NGO and World Central Kitchen. For more information about the premiers and the flyers, are below. As you can see there, there's the information there for the for the premieres, one of which I would go to, and of course the parties, which I'm not really interested in. But yeah, really interested to see that. Um, Ukrainian light knife in resistance. Um, it's, it'll be interesting to see how they're navigating around that whole issue and um, what they're doing now to kind of keep themselves sane considering what's going on in their country. So I can't wait to check that out. I really, really cannot wait to check that out.